You know, there's something bigger than the border between Canada and the United States. Something that binds our lands together better than any international boundary ever could. I'm on a journey to explore that essential element, Aboriginal people. And so I'm using the border as a guide to meet as many fascinating people in as many interesting places as I can. This is about our history, our culture, and our future. Because for me, the border is not a boundary. It's something completely different. And I call it the medicine line. I'm sure everyone has heard the phrase, history is written by winners. From Hollywood movies to school textbooks, First Nations people have often been pushed aside, maybe even made into sidekicks. With the exception of the odd mural or story, Aboriginal people generally don't take center stage. Now I'd never call myself a history buff, but just maybe it's the way that history has been presented to me. The way I read about it in those dusty old books, that just doesn't work for me. I'm going to meet some people who look beyond the textbook and they really try to bring history to life. I'm back home in Winnipeg and I'm heading clear across the city to meet with two local guys who bring history to life through their crazy graphic novels. When I was a kid, you know, I had boxes and boxes full of comics. We'd like, you know, stay up at night with a flashlight reading our comics and and that was really the, the whole idea of doing this was, you know, how do you reach as many youth as you can, give them a comic book, and it's just like, they get hungry for reading. Dave and Scott tell stories through pictures, just like me. So no wonder it kind of speaks to me. And man, the comics I read growing up, they certainly weren't like this. The images here are rooting real events, history that has largely gone untold. We do graphic novels, mostly for educational purposes, uh, looking at teaching more of our youth about their history, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal youth. And Scott draws them up for me and we uh, work together on developing them. I interpret his words and put them into a visual medium to tell the story, just give it a different impact than just sort of reading the story as well and giving it a visual cue, I guess. This is going to be tricky because you want room to show some of the artillery fire down there. And their collaboration touches on some pretty heavy subjects. They're now tackling the story of local war hero, Sergeant Tommy Prince and adapting his story into a graphic novel for school students. I was raised on stereotypes, not from my family, um, but from friends and school and uh, sports teams. And you know, what I learned about Aboriginal people was what other people told me. And I knew I was Aboriginal, so it made me feel really terrible about myself. The loss you feel, and you don't really know why. There's a missing piece. And then this journey of reconnection. Dave really found his groove in his graphic novel series called Seven Generations, which follows the story of Edwin, a young Aboriginal man who's got to learn from his family's past if he's ever going to survive in the present day. So the seventh generation story, tell me what it's really about. I had this big ambition to tell this kind of multi-generational story of one family and the history of that family and what, what the impact was on this one young man. It's a story about identity. It's a story about reconnecting with culture and identity. What does it look like for us as a people to feel that we're detached from our culture? And then following that, what does it look like to learn about our history and our culture and become reconnected with it? And where do we go from there? That growth and that journey, what does that look like? This series is about so many things. European and First Nations contact, a young man coming of age, and the present day challenges facing First Nations people. You know, I've had students write me letters about how much hope and strength it gave them to read these stories, knowing that we're connecting youth to their culture uh, and helping them form stronger identities. You know, simple terms, that's what this series is all about. But what I remember in school is learning about Aboriginal people and you, don't, you learn almost nothing aside from some of our participation in the fur trade, you know, when I was going through school. And I really wanted youth 
looking back on what I experienced to experience real history. Not shying away from the real stuff that has happened through history as First Nations people. But there's a lot of terrible stuff, a lot of good stuff. We wanted to balance those two and, and really teach youth the real history, what really happened to us and what, were the, what was the outcome, the impact of that history. And so, you know, we deal with the residential school system and some of the stuff that went on there and, you know, certainly the smallpox epidemics and why that happened and what, what was their effect on, on us. into the graphic novels. They think about every angle, every character, and exactly how we see them. It's really kind of like making a movie. Flipping right around in front of him, ground level, and you're kind of showing him. You know, when I write, I write very visually. I kind of imagine movies in my head, and I try and write those movies. And, uh, and so, you know, I would come up with a very detailed script, you know, describing each panel, how people are positioned in each panel and everything, and then all the captions and the dialogue, and then I'd take that after probably sometimes eight edits <laughs> and, uh, and give it to Scott and he'd thumbnail it. I found that we worked really well together because we thought a lot alike. I understood what he was trying to relate and whatever I was drawing seemed to really match what Dave was imagining in his own head. And so he'd come up with these thumbnails. We'd get together usually at Starbucks and we'd kind of just pour through them page by page and and finalize what the look was going to be, then he'd go and do the final illustrations and page by page email them to me and kind of, you know, let him know if this is good, maybe we should change a little bit here and go yeah. off to the publisher and then they do their pre-publication stuff and boom goes the dynamite. So based on what we just talked about, a comic book would be an excellent tool for teaching a second language, especially oh, an Aboriginal language. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So translating these books into an Aboriginal language is what the guys are looking into now. Believe it or not, they think the biggest hurdle might be fitting the new words into the speech bubbles. But David has seen the results of the graphic novels in the classroom, and he's pretty sure it's going to be a hit. He says kids are even learning math from books like this, so why not Cree or Ojibwe? Well, I don't know. It looks like it fits all right to me. You know, seeing the finished pages is super cool and then holding the book in your hands and then kind of relating it back to what you saw and what you have now was that's a really good feeling a new book smell and you're like yeah you know we created that man this is cool i was so impressed by the work i just had to see how a drawing comes to life and then i had this idea a really cool way to shoot this would be in time lapse and make that drawing just leap off the page Now I'm south of the border, and there's just something about traveling through the Montana landscape that makes it feel like I'm, I'm just going back in time. And that's really fitting, because I'm here in a story that straddles the fine line between a living history lesson and a time warp. 
so I guess I better figure out exactly where this place is. Today I'm going where everyone's gearing up to recreate one of the biggest and most important Native American battles in U.S. history. The Battle of Little Bighorn. Everyone knows where Last Stand Hill is, but this time I'm going off the Taurus Road to get a glimpse behind the scenes, and I think I know exactly where to find it. I'm headed to the Little Bighorn National Park. That's the place where the battle actually happened and hosted countless visitors every year. I really want to see what the actual battlefield site looks like. If you don't know what happened here, Custer and his cavalry, well, they lost big time. It was epic. The first thing I notice when looking around is that there are markers everywhere to show where warriors died. The landscape in the park is really tricky. There are all sorts of nooks and crannies to hide in. It's no wonder this is one of the most studied battles in American history, although it's hard to tell how everything unfolded. But this isn't where the reenactment really happens. For that, I've got to go just slightly away from all the tourist areas. Some of the most iconic Native American leaders were at the battle that day. I mean, we're talking about Gaul, Crazy Horse, and even Sitting Bull. And this is where the battle recreation actually takes place. And it happens right along the Little Bighorn River. It's in the footsteps of history on Henry Real Bird's property. Each June, on the anniversary of the battle, Henry and his family put on a reenactment, and it's a must-stop kind of thing to see. My Indian name is uh, Baji Wajichish. That's timber leader. I am a Apsaruga. I am a Crow Indian. I own the land here with my brothers and sisters where Custer tried to cross the Little Bighorn River. That's how historic this uh, piece of land is. It's like Plymouth Rock or uh, Billy the Kid's Trail. Yeah. Henry, can you uh, describe in Crow language to me? Describe this to me. Bat I mean, that's great. Bat Chajik. But charge but charge but charge that's that's great uh charge beautiful beautiful it chick chic it chick chic he know where chick chic he know awa it chick chic he know awa it chick chic it chick chic yeah this land is beautiful yeah huh. like that yeah the reenactment that we do the land is the star and all of these characters sitting bull crazy horse bloody knife gall spotted wolf they're, they're, they're all congregated here. And then Custer came, came in from the sunrise and he was delivered. And that's, our, that's how we see it. If I wanted to get an opinion from the other side, mm -hmm. a fair opinion, anybody you could recommend I talk to? John Dorn of uh, Twisp, Washington. He's studied and given the time to uh, understand the battle to where they last saw Custer on Weir Point. But from then on, it's the Indian version. All right. Henry, <laughs> thank you so much again. Right on. John would no doubt fill me in on some of the nitty gritty details of the battle. You get this feeling and the hair on the back of your neck will stand up and you feel that there has to be some spiritual thing going on. There are spirits of the ground here coming from the, the ghosts, I guess, of those who fought and fell here. The hair on the back of my neck standing up. That's wow. So, Tell me about the geography of the battle, and specifically, I mean, like, what happened where? We have to remember that this is not like a, a European or an Eastern American set-piece battle where great armies march towards each other, but spread over a very large area. Custer had a very good eye for terrain. John sure knows a lot about the history of this battle, far more than most. More than me, that's for sure. I guess just reliving it year after year gives him a deeper understanding of it. We will try to make a retreat this way. Across the river? Back across No, the river. we will go into there and race across this ford, splashing water left and right. Good show for the fans. There's a lot of information here. I'm not sure I'm following. The horse holders, Crazy Horse will come out of the willows with his red blanket 
luring us, and we will follow him. Crazy Horse has the red blanket. Got it. Across the ford, breaks Custer's line, rolls back, does sort of a, a semi-flanking action, and then the battle is over. How do I shoot this? How would you shoot this if you were me? If I were you trying to get the best shots of Custer going down in the final scenes and the melee that will happen there, I would be by those logs. Within Got it. Hide behind the log. Of where he actually goes down. We're talking wartime photography, right? We're talking Blowing wartime down. photography. How does it all end? We die. Oh. People come from all over North America and even the world to watch this show. Three and actors? Well, man, they come from just about everywhere. And we're talking countless hours all put in to one weekend. This is all about finding a safe spot where I can set up my camera and not get caught in the crossfire. So here we go. Right now we're on the exact grounds of the original Battle of Little Bighorn. This is Custer's last stand. I'm on the grounds. The reenactment's about to happen right over here. It's all around me. It's about 105 degrees here. Like literally, it's crazy hot. I'm cooking. Everybody's cooking. We got the cavalry up here and the crowd's over there. And behind me somewhere are the Crow Nation Indians. And they explain to me where everything's going to happen. But being here right now, it's not as clear as it was when they showed it to me on the map. So I'm just gonna kinda wing it. The Real Birds Little Bighorn reenactment begins with detailing Native American history from first contact with the Europeans to Lewis and Clark's trek across the country. So soon the Cheyenne were still mad about what happened before. But there were some events they would never forget. Man, now it's what I've been waiting for. This is the main event. The Little Bighorn Battle. Wow, this is cool. Soldiers on horseback. And there's some crazy horse. Man, that is cool. This must be Custer. It's hard to tell. Is this battle starting now? Is it? It sounds like gunshots. And then suddenly, Everyone is headed in the opposite direction. I think they might be headed to Last Stand Hill. I hope I picked the best spot. Here comes the cavalry. Met by the combined tribal nations. I'm pretty sure I know how this is gonna end. time cameraman, but a time traveling wartime cameraman. And you know what? I know this is a reenactment, but man, it feels real.
battle's over and the smoke's clear. And just the experience of shooting this as a cameraman, oh, like, wow. I can't tell you how much rush it was. It should be on everybody's bucket list to actually take part in a reenactment like this. It was just awesome. So maybe I'm not interested in textbook history because that's the clean version. That's the one that's neatly packaged. Dave Roberts and Scott Henderson, as well as all those battle reenactors here, are definitely not putting on the clean version. You know, it's about mud under the fingernails and getting your hands dirty. And I think that really works. Because history is something that happens in a flash. And these events need to be seen from so many perspectives. Because like life, it keeps flowing on past you, no matter who wins or loses. Hey, I'm back on the road and off onto the next story. And this one is a real doozy. It's pretty far from here, so I'm gonna drive through the night just to get there. All cool and said, because that's life on the road.